Okay, I'm going to kick it off, and uh, we'll let uh, people uh, people gather as uh, they finish the uh, ice cream and cookies out there. Uh, um, this uh, panel is the Service Intel Chiefs panel, as if you wouldn't be able to figure that out from uh, people sitting here at the uh, at the table. Uh, I might note that that all five are present and accounted for, and I think that's quite a feat just to <laughs> just to manage, manage schedules and get you five. To, all at the same place at the same time on schedule. That's uh, that's pretty amazing, and I and I thank you uh, here in advance for your for your commitment to the summit and, and, and to this session. Uh, I'd like to mention uh, the sponsor for this breakout session is Microfocus uh, Government Solutions. I think you know the card process by now. Uh, fill them out uh, early, write often. Uh, uh, the choices are either. I'll ask your questions or I'll ask mine, and so uh, you know, your chance to get yours uh, on the table is by holding one of those cards up and, uh, and having somebody uh, uh, collect it on the, uh, you know, off the aisles. Let me start off with a couple of, of questions uh, to sort of set the stage here. Uh, um, we've done this uh, Service Intel Chief panel at each of the, uh, at the summits, but you know, in the last year an awful lot of things have have changed. One of the real notable uh, things is the publication of the national security strategy and the associated uh, national defense strategy and the emphasis that's placed in both those documents on uh, China and Russia as, uh, as, as competitors. And, and so what I'd like to do is start off with the, uh, uh, the panel and uh, and ask, uh, ask each of them, uh, what does that increased emphasis meant for service intel chiefs and what changes have been brought about as a result? And let me, let me drop back a second while you think about the answer to my question. I should do introductions, I think, to, uh, to be properly formal here. And, uh, and let me go from... Be properly formal. Properly formal and speak into the microphone. I heard everything you said. <laughs> I figured, <laughs> well, that's one of the first times I've been told that I didn't talk loud enough. Um, so let's go from, uh, you know, from my left, uh, uh, Scott Berenger, the uh, Army G2, Dash Jameson, the Air Force A2, Rob Hayes, the Coast Guard CG2, I think is the way you do it, uh, Dimitri Henry, who is the Intel Chief for the Marine Corps, and Matt Kohler, who is the Intel Chief for the Navy. So back to the question then about uh, Russia and China and the emphasis, and, and what has that meant for each of you and for the service chiefs that you support? And Scott, why don't we, we'll come down the, you know, in row, the row this time, and then we'll jump around from here on, if I could start with you. Thanks, great to be here, and uh, thanks for hosting the panel. For the, for the Army, it's really, it's really about lethality. If you think about where we've come from in the last 17 years, the Army and really all the services have become very, very good at finding and fixing targets in the CTVEO coin fight. Uh, and I think the NDS puts a spotlight on, on where we need to go with lethality. So for the focus of the Army, it's really about standing up uh, Modernization Command, Futures Command, and those six CFTs, really focusing on lethality and intelligence is embedded into each one of those uh, CFTs as we go forward. So for the Chief, Right now, it's all about lethality and modernization. Okay. So first, I'd, I would also like to say thank you very much for INSA for hosting this service panel. It is one of the rare times we actually get together, get to see each other, and, and to compare some notes. So um, I'm going to say I, I would echo my colleague here from the Army, bolstering lethality and readiness clearly is our objective, as stated in the NDS. But to give you some additional information um, I, I'd like to characterize why we're in this great power competition. And, and I'm sure that what I'm going to say you, you have heard before, but I think it really does echo the sentiment that we're not just in a counterterrorism VEO realm. We're in a full contested environment. When you have um, a near peer comp competitor such as China, you have to look at what has the dynamic changed with them coming on the scene. Uh, and, and so I'll just go over some things that China has increased in, in some of their equipment that they've postured that you all can then draw some conclusions from on why lethality readiness is really fundamental to all of the services. 
And I would start off with um, the Chinese increasing their accuracy and stockpiles of long-range missiles, allowing them to threaten our allies and some sovereign U.S. soil. So when you look at that, you can look at, hmm, they've got surface-to-air missiles that have been stationed in the South China Sea to where they said they were not going to posture defense. When you look at the ranges of their, long, uh, of their systems, you do see it is not just threatening to Asia, but it does threaten other areas uh, and other aspects of partners that we have in addition to our own soil. When you look at where are they going with technology, you kind of have to take a look at their investment strategy. And, and it, it kind of is hinted at in the, the One Belt, One Road initiative, but I'm gonna take a look at where they wanted to go with certain aspects of technology. And for example, they're investing $150 billion in the next 10 years in the semiconductor industry. That has both civilian and military aspects. Two years ago, um, China launched the first quantum satellite. And quantum computing for communications is essential because it really protects point to point, so your transcription can be unhackable, if you will, uh, from space uh, to the ground. So, so they're looking at things in a very diverse manner. And then finally, I, I would kind of like to end with, because I'm sure we're going to talk about disruptive technologies, but China has stated that they want to be primacy in artificial intelligence by 2030, and they intend on continuing to invest. In 2017, they invested about $12 billion. In 2020, they're going to invest about $20 billion. And then in 2030, they're going to invest about $120 billion. These are significant numbers in where they're looking at um, creating what I would call trying to get the, the advantage uh, on use of for both civilian and military aspects. And then if you look at Russia, Russia's not really sitting by idly. Russia has, as we all know, conducted operations in Syria, and it really has been a proving ground for them to execute some of their latest technologies. So I just want to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music uh, with a couple of examples. And the first one I would talk about is the testing and fielding of hypersonic mis uh, missiles that they're able to launch from their MiG-31s. In addition, Vladimir Putin also has seized on the concept of artificial intelligence. And he's actually been quoted as saying, humanity's future and the country that masters artificial intelligence will rule the world. Now, that's a little disturbing uh, when it comes from Putin because we kind of see he does not exactly have Western values or Western ethics when he, when he applies technology to his system. And then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up with, they also put out an artificial intelligence strategy where they highlighted five initiatives. And the one that, when we say, when somebody copies you, it's the highest form of flattery. They're investing in a DARPA-like version of their own to do testing and evaluation and field some artificial intelligence concepts for both military and civilian. So in addition to why are we looking at bolstering our readiness and our lethality, we have to look at the threat and what are they investing in? What are they testing and evaluating? And what future technologies are they evaluating to get a, what they call a competitive advantage over the United States? So with that, I'll pass it off to my Coast Guard colleague. Thank you. I think you'll see here that there's going to be a range of perspectives representing different services. And I think we might be, Coast Guard might be a little bit of the outlier and, and present a little bit different angle. So if you look at our national strategies, there's a sense of cooperate where we can and compete vigorously where we must. And I would say, for the Coast Guard, we fall kind of within that spectrum. In some areas, there's cooperation going on. So in, in places like the Arctic, we're trying to ensure that there's a cooperative domain there uh, between us and the other countries in the Arctic Council. Uh, China's not, but has aspirations and has signaled an intent to be an Arctic nation, at least operate up there. And so we're seeing up there quite a bit, and we are finding ways to cooperate with the Russians and others on the Arctic Council, but also the Chinese as they operate there. And then things like the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum, which brings together Japan, South Korea, 
uh, China, Russia, Canada, and the United States to collectively work on security uh, in, in the North Pacific. But then there's the aspect of how do we compete, and we're seeing China and Russia in our hemisphere quite a bit more. Uh, in addition to all the activities that have already been mentioned, you know, their ships uh, come and their aircraft coming into our hemisphere quite a bit, and oftentimes the Coast Guard is part of the solution as far as how do we monitor them, how do we uh, keep track of what they're doing. Uh, but then also using the Coast Guard for uh, partnership engagement and capacity building for regional countries that might help us to offset China and Russia. So in Vietnam, Philippines, India, Japan, and with places like Ukraine and Georgia, Coast Guard being a good matchup with some of those navies and their Coast Guards as far as developing capacity, uh, promoting information sharing so that we can collectively act as a counterweight uh, to both China and Russia as uh, near peer adversaries. All right, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the Marine Corps, uh, in the national defense strategy, uh, our role is pretty clear. Our peer uh, pacing threat is China, and uh, the Commandant has uh, made it clear as we uh, prepare to uh, meet the peer threat in the future that uh, we have to modernize and we have to uh, upgrade our readiness. Uh, if we do those things and when we uh, get down that path of where we want to be, we will be more lethal and able to uh, meet that threat. From an intel perspective, for me and, and the folks that uh, make up the Marine Corps ISR enterprise, what that means is we have to get back to doing what we used to do uh, before those wars started in the, in the Middle East uh, in earnest uh, in the early 2000s. And that is we need to understand the kill chains and how to get inside those kill chains so that uh, we can allow the force to close with and, and destroy whatever uh, element is out there that, that uh, is in our way. And so for the intel piece of the Marine Corps, those things that are going to enable the Marine Corps to be more lethal, uh, what we really need to do in the future and, and as we work to get to the future is be able to make sure that our Marines are trained uh, and ready to use the technologies and all of those things that uh, everyone, uh, certainly here in the hallways as you walk through, it's all about cyber, it's all about tech. Uh, I'm more concerned about a Marine being able to utilize that technology and being able to use uh, their brain housing in, in order to make us more lethal and effective. Uh, I'm sure that we'll, we'll get the technology and we'll adopt that technology uh, to help us fight in a better way. But uh, my mandate is pretty clear, and, and that is modernize, get our readiness up, and then understand kill chains so that we can get inside those kill chains and uh, disrupt them so that the force can do what it needs to do. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I join the others in, uh, in thanking you the opportunity to be with all of you here today. Uh, for those that are paying attention here, there's one on the panel that does not look like the others. Uh, I think I got the wrong uniform pick here with the <laughs> bright shining white. Um, one of my panel members uh, threatened that they might throw some uh, off-colored food on my uniform. I, I won't mention who that is, but the initials, I think, are Dash Jameson. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it is a great opportunity to be here, um, and as highlighted, um, we welcome uh, this opportunity for ourselves to get together, which is, which is not often enough. Uh, but with the challenges that we are facing here with the Great Power Competition, uh, we find that all of us that have grown up together, we are partnering and, and, and turning to face a shared threat. So um, we talk about the national defense strategy and what's in here, and many of the panel, panel members have talked about it already, um, what, it, what it means to us, this re, re, a return to a great power competition. Uh, though we're not returning, there's some aspects of it that might feel familiar for some of the more mature people in the audience. Careful. That was... Uh, Around during the Cold War, uh, I remember some mentoring here from you're, you're going to get some from Abel Jacoby and and uh, Admiral Cothran and there's a few others in the audience. But um, you know, the for for the Navy, it it uh, it means a lot in terms of what we've had to do to adjust. Uh, from 9/11, uh, the Navy adjusted uh, to meet the requirements as it should uh, to adjust towards a counter-terror, land-focused power projection kind of threat. Uh, we all did here. All our services did that and adjusted our culture, and I couldn't agree more with General Barrier. It was about delivering lethality when our nation needed it. Uh, from a Navy perspective, we adjusted to that and, and 
and got really good at power projection. And we were able to do that and operate uh, from the freedom of international waters and operated however, whenever we wanted. We were, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the demise of the great adversary of the Soviet Navy, uh, we were no longer challenged uh, in any real way in our ability to, to operate where we wanted and how we wanted to. Uh, and so in essence of a, of a return to a great co power competition has changed all of that. Uh, the advent of what uh, our adversaries like Russia and China are fielding along with new technologies uh, has threatened our freedom of maneuver. And it is a culture shift for many in the Navy that have come in since 9-11 that have not used to, uh, not used to operate in that kind of environment. Uh, key type of sea control functions, only something that uniquely a Navy can provide. Maintaining dominance of our undersea type of capabilities is critical. Uh, again, only things that a Navy can provide. Uh, the kind of skill sets from um, an intelligence and information warfare standpoint of, uh, of the type of ISR, maritime domain ISR, counter ISR, the ability to remain undetected uh, while targeting the enemy in a maritime environment. Maneuvering in electromagnetic maneuver type of space, it's not just physical maneuver for us, it's be able to be adaptable in electromagnetic maneuver environments as well to remain untargeted. Uh, all these are skills uh, that had waned because we were not challenged. Uh, and getting the Navy back up on step with that is, is the path the Navy has been on for several years. Uh, we have uh, adjusted ourselves and made large organizational shifts. A uh, command that I just left two months ago, Navy Information Forces, that's designed to provide readiness for our information warfare white warfighting capabilities, uh, was designed to ensure that the readiness of those forces was, was on step. We established um, our Navy Information Warfighting Development Center, our top gun, if you will, of, of naval, naval aviation counterpart, to raise the bar in terms of our skills to operate in those domains, like I mentioned, ISR and counter ISR, all those skills that are gonna be necessary and, and, and frankly decisive in any type of next naval engagement uh, with the kind of, of adversaries that we're facing. Uh, those are just some of the challenges and changes um, that we are looking at, and I'll stand by for any questions you may have. Let me, uh, let me just ask uh, Matt if you can, can you give us a sense of what the Russian Navy is doing now in a peacetime posture, and then if any of the rest of you have sort of peacetime, uh, you know, little um, insights to share with the audience, it might give us a sense of what their op tempo is like. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to start with that. Um, so we roll off the great power comp com competitors here, Russia and China, like they're, like they're similar in any way, and they're, of course, completely different uh, in terms of capacity and capabilities. Uh, what we're seeing uh, from the N Russian Navy, uh, a fraction of its size of what it was in the Cold War, probably about a sixth of its size, uh, but it has focused on quality, uh, not quantity, and I would offer that uh, what they are producing in, in terms of a naval force um, is delivering certainly far better and far lethal kind of platforms that we've seen from them in the last 20 years. And we're seeing them use those um, in a way that Russians are uniquely able to do. They, they're, they're good chess masters and they are, they are playing the table. Uh, and we're seeing their presence in places uh, in a much more robust way in the Northern Atlantic. We're seeing them highly active in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and they are playing uh, to their strengths. Uh, they don't have large numbers, but I'd say they're using the capabilities in, in uh, an effective way. I'll jump in. Uh, when you look at Russia, uh, since I am the Air Force uh, ISR Directorate in charge, I'll look at my counterpart. So I look at three main areas that Russia has been um, capitalizing on. First is their nuclear capability. They have completely modernized and mobilized their nuclear capability in the last uh, 15 years. When we take a look at what are they doing from a space capability, they have invested and looked at diversifying their space capability. While they've had some issues with some launch, uh, they still have been a driving force for making the space domain a competitive and a contested domain and alleviating it from being a benign environment. And if we look at the, at the 
at their air forces. We can look at long range aviation and they are flying much more frequently uh, and doing some trans-regional navigation than they have in the recent years. In addition, if you look at Syria from their, from not just long range aviation, but look at their fighter force, uh, look at their command and control aviation, and look at some other activities, they have cycled in approximately 80 to 85 percent of their pilots to get combat experience in Syria. So they have actually looked at, my assessment is they have looked at what am I going to prioritize? How am I going to look at testing, training for my own readiness? And where am I going to cost effectively utilize the dollars, the very limited dollars that I have to prioritize where do I need to compete with the West and how do I go about doing that? And I did mention earlier, but I'll repeat it again, they have used Syria as a testing ground from all sorts of munitions, from surface to surface cruise missiles, to aircraft, to command and control, just to name a few. Uh, from a ground perspective with uh, Russian forces, a, a very similar story. Um, since about 2000, their forces, while they have gotten smaller, have gotten leaner. Uh, focusing on smaller formations with a higher level of lethality. If you look at what they're doing in the near abroad, uh, closer to home, uh, you know, they are pressuring, uh, certainly pressuring NATO. And also, I, I agree with Dash, what they've done with their ground forces in Syria has become kind of a testing ground uh, for them to test concepts and, and copy some of the capabilities that we've, we've acquired o over the years. So th they are active, uh, and, and I think they're uh, continuing to improve. <coughs> if I might, so just not at the same end of the spectrum as Admiral Colwer was talking about, but we're seeing a recapitalization of their offshore patrol cutters, their icebreakers. For, the Ru for Russia, about one-fifth of their land mass is north of the Arctic Circle. And as the ice recedes, that's opening a lot of more economic viability for them, LNG and oil exploration up there. So that's huge, uh, given some of the other trends with their economy. The only thing I would highlight is, is in the cyber domain, something that concerns mm -hmm. us, the Coast Guard, as we look at our critical infrastructure here. Uh, Russia's used the last few years to really treat Ukraine in some ways as a test lab for them as far as how do they target critical infrastructure and refine their TTPs for carrying out uh, operations in the cyber domain. And that's concerning as you look at where they might apply that elsewhere. What if I, Dimitri, you got- is, I'm not going to say anything there's... because I got the Navy, I got the ground, I got <laughs> air, and we're all three of those, so I think we're covered. Yeah, I'm on your side though. <laughs> Dash brought up uh, the, uh, the discussion to, or introduced the discussion of space. Uh, um, you know, that's, that's another sort of key change in the last year since we, uh, since we got together, at least the, uh, uh, the public discussion of space and space as a contested uh, uh, area. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm interested in uh, uh, any discussion you'd like to have about space, the threat piece, and if you could weave in the how capable are your individual intelligence services with respect to the space, the space threat, space operations, as the discussion about emphasis on, on a space-related uh, uh, combatant commander and then potentially a, a space force in the future. How, how well are we set right now with a skill set uh, that, uh, that's going to be much discussed and, and very much in demand? And, it's probably better to have a little order and discipline to this. Uh, um, why don't we, Matt, why don't we start with you and sort of work your way down and then from, from here on it'll be jump all kinds of things. The other, the other thing I put on the table is many in the audience are from industry. So as I ask the questions, if you would just have in mind as panelists places where industry could play, must play, where you're going to have needs, I think that that would be uh, uh, particular interest and maybe space is, is one of those areas where, uh, where where some of those kinds of capabilities might apply. So Matt, why don't we go down the line? Um, I think all the services will tell you is we are uh, highly dependent upon uh, space um, to support our warfighting capabilities as well as a, a now a increasingly warfighting domain of its own and certainly the Navy's is in that category of uh, being high de highly dependent upon the kind of capabilities that space delivers. Uh, the maritime environment, as uh, described, is in increasingly a uh, competitive environment, uh, and space falls into that as well. Uh, so wherever um, 
our nation is going with respect to space, you're going to find the Navy heavily involved. Um, our skill set uh, within the Navy uh, is described as a space cadre. Uh, these are warfare qualified uh, naval officers, qualified in air, surface, subsurface, information warfare, who through a series of education and experience tours develop a space expertise. And we manage the cadre that way, as well as our acquisition, uh, uh, specialists in space acquisition uh, kind of positions. Um, and, and that's how the Navy uses the, uh, the skill sets to leverage the space that it needs. Uh, we have just completed uh, nearly a, a year-long review of, um, of that space cadre, what positions they're assigned to, uh, are we invested in the right place? And the answer is we weren't. Uh, and we looked down to the tactical level, to our strike groups, to our operational level at our maritime operations centers, our numbered fleets, as, as well as uh, acquisition positions, and just did a, a scrub to see, did, did we have the, the right alignment? Do we have the right level of trained personnel in the right positions? And the answer is not quite. Uh, and so we identify what the target is and are shifting that alignment. Um, again, driven by a great power competition, uh, things have changed, and the requirements for that skill set has, has, has changed as well, and we're adapting to it. Uh, where we're going, uh, or where our nation's going with a, um, a proposed space command, and space force, uh, the answer is we're all in. Um, uh, some of those are more clear than others in the path and where that's going. Uh, we're just going to be absolutely part of that dialogue and aligned wherever that uh, we find the final decisions are made. All right, um, for, for us, uh, obviously, uh, the Admiral just spoke about uh, the, the use of space uh, in everything we do, actually, and that's no different for the Marine Corps. Uh, what, what we see as, a, as key for us, though, is getting comfortable not communicating, getting comfortable not being able to get updates uh, as timely as we get them now, and, and building a Marine Corps and Marines that are capable of thinking without uh, having direct orders every single step. And that takes a, a culture shift uh, because we've been uh, able to dominate that space. We think that we won't be able to dominate that space uh, in the out years, and we know it'll be contested. So everything we're doing is going to be exercising how you function without space and, and uh, go ahead and fight through that. In order to do that, you know, I'll go back to the, the line that you're going to hear me say every time. It's about training and educating the force so that uh, we can understand mission type orders and be able to operate uh, in the blind if need to be, if need be, uh, and then uh, other forms of communications that uh, don't require space. Some of that stuff we used to do when I was a young Marine, and we'll learn to do it again because we know that uh, we'll have to be ready to do it in case that time comes. As far as uh, the Marine Corps' role and how we uh, view a space force, the Marine Corps is always going to do those other orders as the president uh, directs, and the president directed that uh, the stand-up of this force and the Marine Corps play its part in ensuring that the nation has a space force that's, that's capable and required. Coast Guard perspective, very little to say about the space force. Yes, probably being part of it. Just something for industry awareness, I would say, is uh, we're looking at is, uh, as CubeSats and SmallSats develop, we have a partnership with a bunch of other federal agencies and a launch with SpaceX later this year, launching a small constellation. Help us with some coverage in the Arctic, which is an area that's uh, not as well supported from a communications and a sensor perspective, and evaluating that to see how well that works for us, uh, managing the data, downlinks, and all that. Think if it's better for us to work with other partners to manage a small constellation, or as industries evolve, in, as industries evolving, just purchase data or purchase services from industry instead. So we're kind of excited about that test up. Well, I would agree with what my colleagues have said, and I'm I'm going to kind of take a, a a page from what uh, Dimitri talked about. Of course, we're going to look at. Uh, opportunities to execute without, but we are not going to cede any domain. Just because space is contested does not mean we're gonna cede that and have the adversary with a sanctuary domain that we don't intend to defend or operate from. So I, I would say as a result of that, uh, in our Air Force Next Generation ISR Dominance Flight Plan, we actually had an annex, have an annex on ISR from and for space. 
And so industry absolutely can help us with our operations in space because we have to look at it as a domain where operations are going to take place within it because traditionally and up to this point we have looked at it as a domain that operations have taken place from it to the terrestrial. So we absolutely need to have a partnership with industry as we evolve what are we going to do for operations whether they be to defend or project from space within space. The other aspect that, that I would offer is space gives us the ability to help us balance our Air Force ISR portfolio. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, in addition to what has traditionally been coined a standoff capability, it gives us a penetrating and persistent capability where we can employ with industry capabilities in the different orbits uh, and belts in space to ha actually enable us to fix on a target and maintain con con custody of that target to help us with our kill chain. Now we're gonna have to make some cost effective decisions as to what, where, when, and how much, but we have to do that in a partnership with industry. And, and it's gonna be a different partnership in that it'll also be a government and commercial capability. As uh, Rob talked about, we don't necessarily have to own everything. We can lease, we can purchase when we need, where we need, for what we need. If we actually look at the explosion of capabilities within space and we look at just imaging capability, in the next three to five years, we will have the Earth covered with an image every three to five minutes. Well, there you have it. Commercial capability is out there and it can be used. It can be used both by the adversary and by us. We just have to be smart about how are we going to use it because we are not going to cede the territory that space offers us. The other thing that I would, uh, I would answer is we need to have a, look, a serious look at how do we actually get and use the distances that space offer us. And, and we are exploring and looking at, just as our adversaries are with quantum computing and hypersonics, but I think that's a rich area where industry can help partner with us for operations within space and operations from space. So I kind of gave you a little insight into our Air Force Next Generation ISR flight plan and the annex, uh, because we're looking at a balanced portfolio. And when I mean a balanced portfolio, we have traditionally in the past 17 years done a very heavy investment in a permissive airborne capability. And our portfolio in the flight plan really takes a look at what can we work with with industry uh, to look at space capabilities, to look at cyber capabilities, to look at manned, unmanned, kinetic, not kinetic, uh, and, and look at speed whether it be hypersonic or extremely, extremely slow. We all know there are difficulties visualizing both and, and keeping track of both areas. So we need to have you, you come up with some ideas that we can build upon, and we look forward to working with you. The, the Army perspective on this is we, we believe that uh, space will, will be a contested domain. It's a very important domain for the Army, whether it's communications, uh, precision navigation and timing, targeting, whatever that is, we, we know that we're going to be reliant uh, on space. And so what, what we need from industry really, in addition to what Dash said, and I think we're closely linked with the Air Force as they looked at, at space and what, the, what is the future of ISR, we, we need redundancy and persistent surveillance from space. So if you think about it, if you go back to that VO and coin fight that I mentioned and, and putting a Reaper, Predator, Gray Eagle or whatever over target for 20 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, we need that same capability from space, uh, and and we know we know that it'll be contested, but we think that that uh, the technology is out there for you to help us with that and actually deny our enemies and our adversaries uh, that same space. And so we need your help there. Thanks. I've got a couple questions here that have to do with uh, uh, what types of commercial data might the services be looking to purchase or. How does open source information fit into your to your planning, uh, Rob? You and Dash both mentioned uh, uh, types of commercial data. How about we do a jump ball here? Any other things that uh, that people would want to put on the table that fall in that category of either open source uh, needs or commercial data needs? 
Yeah, I'll jump on that one. We, we don't really call it open source. We really call it publicly available information. Uh, and that is another annex in the ISR flight plan. And that is 100% commercial off the shelf capability. And uh, I think that uh, Scott, Ian, and I are, are pretty aligned on this. We actually wanna flip our paradigm where we traditionally have looked at exquisite DOD intelligence and done all of our indications and warning and tipping and cuting and, and assessments from that. And there is a wealth of data that is out there in the public domain. And so we wanna actually use publicly available information as our starting point and flip that to where we start with that. What that means is we actually have to work with industry to help us with defining and developing algorithms so that we can sift through and ensure that what we're using from the public domain is actually true. It doesn't have malicious code. It's not false. It's not deceptive. So we've got to work together on artificial intelligence means to get at developing algorithms so that we can identify when in fact we're dealing with pure data from the public domain. The other aspect of commercial capability is it really is not about the next sensor or about a platform. It really is about the data. And, and we must work together so that we can have an open architecture construct so that the data can flow within a service, across the services, in a joint fight, because the data will actually give you the answers to questions that you haven't posed. And right now, our construct is we're building a sensor to answer a specific question. That's okay. Technology is caught up with us to where we can use commercial, off-the-shelf capabilities with your commercial data standards so that when we build an open architecture construct, we can actually share the data and we can learn from it. And where we would partner with you is coming up with different algorithms, coming up with different apps, coming up with different ways to filter and sift that data. I think you made a great point. If we can just, I don't know if we can stress enough, paradigm is a shift. I'm going to not talk about specific data per se, but just so much publicly available information, whether it's commercial data, social media, imagery, and other sensors that's available, like you said, mapping the world every mm -hmm. three to five minutes, that the competitive advantage that we once enjoyed with national technical means, everybody, not everybody, but almost everybody has access very rapidly to reams and, and, and lots of data. So it's how do we mine that as best we can? Because Coast Guard perspective, I think for others as well, sharing with partners, whether they're international or in some cases for us industry, when we're dealing with natural disasters or other things, I think publicly available information, less concerned about classification and a lot easier to get to rel to whoever using information that's not restricted by sources. More of a paradigm shift towards how do we move the lever towards uh, getting more access. And I'm going to jump in one more time because I think that um, General Henry has brought up an outstanding point, and it's about training. One way that industry can really help us is we have a young generation who has grown up in the digital age and understands coding, understands that they are going to have a device with them at all times. So they're not afraid of human machine teaming. Then there's the rest of us, and especially us older set, that um, grew up in an analog world, and there is a fear of human machine teaming, a fear that a machine is gonna replace a human, which is kind of ludicrous if you really start to think about it. But we've got to look and pair with industry on how do we actually change how we train and how do we take fear away from human machine teaming and how do we set it as it's a wingman stance or a fellow rifleman where we can get the most out of the machine and, and use it in that light, because our youngest generation, if you, if you were to go into an elementary school, just about any school that started in the last week, almost every single student was issued some kind of pad, starting with kindergarten, to start learning from. They understand human and machine teaming. We have to get our head around, what does that mean? What does it mean when we human and machine team and how do we change our training so that it's an accepted and excitable transition? Because that will work towards retention and better accession rates than we might have if we ignore human-machine teaming. 
I think there's a uh, there's also a speed and agility question here. If you look at our service acquisition systems that really underpin our, our analytical foundations in each one of the services, those are all built on models that are that are years old and take years to develop over time. This this technology that Dash uh, is talking about re requires speed, agility, injects into into our systems that move faster than the acquisition system does as well. And if, if you go back to Dash's comment on, on kids and talent management, we also need data scientists because this is a big problem and you need big brains to solve it. We have to be more agile on how we attract that kind of talent uh, into the military to work with you on uh, AI, ML, and how to manage uh, the data and commercial solutions, and we're not doing that very well. Um, well uh, at the risk of not uh, try, or trying to avoid uh, some great comments made already, um, the comment about uh, open source or publicly available information, I, I would add the perspective I think, and it was commented here by the members on the panel, I think we're always going to need uh, exquisite, deep penetrating aspects of, of what um, finite sources will provide for us. But from an all source perspective, I would say what's changed significantly with the aspect of great power competition um, is how more increasingly relevant, I would say the, the public available information was always part of our trade. Um, but when you have adversaries now operating much more globally, you know, having an adversary like China that uh, with this one belt, one road, is operating in, in, a, in a much broader domain that uh, allows the kind of open source to become increasingly relevant and important to what it, what it can tell us. Um, the one point I would make is we're, we seem to be shifting towards some discussions on, on machine learning and other aspects. It's another complete conversation we can have. It, um, where I think industry can help us a lot um, and I think each of the services they're dealing with in different ways uh, is help with a, where I think industry has succeeded in many ways of, a, of a data standards and data strategies. Uh, for us to be really successful about working uh, across large elements of data that we need to be sharing uh, certainly across the services and the ability to collect it, but the ability to operate that requires a, uh, a cleaner approach in terms of, of focusing on the data first. What is the data and what is our strategy moving forward on this one? I think, I think the technology is going to drive us that way, um, but it's an area where I think we could probably use a lot of help in terms of skills. I'd like to uh, sort of close out the AI ML part of the discussion because we could go on all day and, and philosophize there, but do any of you have specific projects uh, or or prototyping, or uh, some type, type of targeted effort in the AI ML area that you're intending to uh, pursue over the next 12 or 18 months. And let's sort of bring the AI ML discussion down to a very tactical level, but uh, anything, uh, anything that you're going to put particular emphasis on and try to achieve results in in the next uh, short period of time? I see you nodding, Scott, so we'll let so, you start. No, I'll there. go first on that. So the Army, the Army probably has anywhere from a dozen to 15 different um, smaller AI, ML projects going on across, the server to service, or across our service really related to the CFTs and the kinds of things that we're doing. Where I see this going for uh, Army Intel is really what I would call support to mission command or mission command intelligence. And this is, so think of an analytical foundation where, where you go in and uh, you automatically through... Uh, AI and, the, and, the, and assistance from the cloud have a train analysis that's already done. And then you reach into that cloud for, say, a doctrinal template of a given enemy formation, and the AI and the algorithm really, really portray that threat uh, on the terrain for you so the analyst doesn't really have to do it. And then the analyst can just tweak it and think about it, doesn't really have to draw icons on a map anymore. That is where we're going to. And then assistance with tools to help in collection management, reaching into databases that we don't have access to right now. We, we believe that a construct like that to support mission command intelligence will enable us to go much faster on the ground and really enable a brigade combat team or a division or a corps going into a future fight. Uh, so that is how we're looking at, at AI, ML, and, and really commercial solutions, and we want to partner with you to help us help us get there, and I'll turn it over to whoever wants to go next. Well, I'll jump in, and I would say that, you know, all of the services, uh, we have multiple initiatives going on for AI, ML. But I think one of the things I'd like to stress is for industry, you actually really want to partner with our younger folks. 
you traditionally have come to us or to uh, the colonels to, to make a pitch. We have set up, and I think almost every service has done this, um, prototyping and DevOps environments where we actually can look at a problem that the young airmen, uh, whether they be you know, a combat brigade team, a, a, a flying squadron, space squadron, cyber squadron, ISR squadron, whatever, we're sending them to these labs where they actually take their problems, they have ideas and they sit with coders and we need industry to come in to partner with us in these DevOps environments because when we look at the old, the old industrial model was, I'm gonna tell you here are the five things that I wanna develop and we're gonna develop them. I can tell you in the next 12 to 18 months, I don't know what I wanna develop, but I know that I've got a lot of gaps and seams and I know the airmen know exactly how they wanna fix that. They just don't have the capability. So we are creating these environments uh, where we can bring in industry to sit with our partners. And our, and, and our examples would we be we have Kessel Run in, uh, in Boston, in DC, in Austin. We have AFWorks out in Las Vegas. We have environments where we can bring you in to sit down with our airmen to address these issues. And I think it really is get into that environment where it's live, innovative, iterative development to change the mindset and model of, I'm going to write a proposal, you're going to answer, and we're going to go from there, to it being an iterative scheme where we collaborate together. Now, it's not going to happen for every single acquisition model, but it is going to happen for a lot of the software models. And really, when we're talking about AI and ML, we're talking about software. And so we've got to break our paradigms of how do we actually interact and work with each other. I've got quite a few questions having to do with manpower, skills, readiness. Uh, let me let me start with the, the you know, sort of a readiness uh, 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 discussion and question. Um, we've had the bad years of sequestration. Now we've had a couple of good years of of a uh, of, of better budget uh, climate. Uh, uh, how do you assess your readiness posture today? Are there significant gaps? And if so, uh, do you have specific uh, uh, approaches in mind to uh, to fill those gaps in? And Matt, you've been uncharacteristically quiet, so why don't we start on this end and work our way down? Yeah, next time I'm not gonna sit next to you at the panel, I think. <laughs> that um, was the last seat. It was. <laughs> no one else wanted to sit next to you. Um, there's a, a lot of challenges that we face. Uh, the demands on all our forces, I think, are, are, are stressing readiness requirements across the board with new technologies, are stressing new skill in, in introductions here. You've heard about some of them already. Um, one area is that I will comment on um, an aspect uh, that I talk about a lot in Navy circles, and I talk about information warfare um, that includes our intelligence professionals, that includes our information technology folks that handle our comms and our networks. It's it's the, the folks that understand the environment that we operate in, our meteorologists, oceanographic folks, and our space cadre, as well as our cryptologic warfare fo folks, SIGINT, cyber, um, electronic warfare. It covers uh, all, the, all the turf with respect to information warfighting for us. Uh, I, we're different in, in many of the other warfighting domains um, and unique in some ways, one of which is the extent of which we rely on and use our civilian as part of our warfighting workforce. Some of them are our, our, our high-end specialists, scientists, and others, uh, and some of them are the folks that, that uh, have the deep knowledge that we're looking for in terms of knowledge of the adversary or even some of our cyber uh, engineering kind of capabilities. And so the readiness of our civilian workforce matters. It matters to us a lot. Uh, and Jake, you highlighted on some of the challenges that we faced from hiring freezes and uh, sequestration and others, and it, it put a, a dent in our workforce. Uh, so we've been emphasizing that heavily um, in, in getting um, a hiring levels back to where they were. Um, two barriers to us getting there was just the hiring process itself. Uh, to hire a government employee takes excruciating a long period of time. Whether you're talking a GG employee or GS-based em employee, the process can take a significant period of time, months, many months, uh, and the talent won't wait that long. 
Uh, so we've been successful in the GG realm of shortening that process down to a miraculous less than 80 days, uh, which still ought to sound appalling to you, but it's 20% uh, shorter than when we started. Uh, and I'm putting that in a quasi-win uh, category. Uh, the other is the backlog that we have on our security clearances that occurred. Um, we were backlogged with a combination of Navy and Marine. We were well over 120,000 folks. We've been pushing hard on innovative ways uh, to reduce that backlog. We've used a, a combination of what we call um, uh, hubbing and surging. We've, we've taken our, the, the finite investigating workforce and put them in key fleet concentration areas uh, with the commands tuned to know that that workforce is there and we've been able to have great success uh, and getting the interviews and some of those pieces that are the slow parts of the clearance process executed, as well as surging teams into other um, less dense fleet, fleet concentration areas. And, and we've um, seen some immediate results with the well over 10% reduction in the backlogs and what we're doing. So um, those are some of the challenges that I see, but uh, the, the payoffs are huge. When you're able to bring in that kind of talent uh, and hold that talent to your workforce, I think it's a real enabler. Now, I'll talk about the uh, manpower piece first and what the, what the Marine Corps has done uh, over the last uh, about 18 months and uh, to get at the readiness piece of this uh, through the manpower portion. And that is uh, we've created a deputy commandant for information uh, because the commandant and the deputy commandants, uh, as they were looking at the problem and looking at the future operating environment, uh, it was determined that... Uh, the things that we've been talking about up here really all involve information, moving information, sifting through it and all of that. And we had no focal point uh, in the Marine Corps to be able to harness that and be able to get the Marine Corps all rowing in the same direction. So the Deputy Commandant for Information was created and what that does is uh, allow uh, the Commandant to have one belly button to push that says, okay, how are we gonna man, train and equip the force in order to fight and win in that environment that is truly an, an information environment and one that uh, our peer our peer threats and near peer threats certainly uh, have a have a hand in as well. Uh, we created uh, MEF intelligence groups, uh, and that didn't come uh, uh, without cost. Uh, we cut some combat uh, forces in order to bring in uh, the capability that we thought we would need in the future to be able to fight and win in that environment and enhance those uh, forces that are already there. And I, I talked a little bit about that already as, as part of the intel capability in the Marine Corps. Uh, if we get that right, if we get those Marines right, the manpower side of that, the training part of that, then we will be more lethal. We will be able to fight in a contested environment. We will be able to take whatever technology we have and use it to its fullest. Uh, and then as technology uh, unfolds, we'll be able to adapt that technology and adopt it <coughs> to our own way of fighting and uh, not have to uh, relearn how to fight uh, different technologies every time. Uh, to do that, um, again, I'll go back to training. And uh, my pitch for industry is always going to be help me get Marines in a, in a position where they can immerse uh, in training, uh, immerse in an environment that's uh, interactive, real time, and they're able to reset and go back and, and repeat and do it on their own time and continually train and educate themselves over and over again until we can't get it wrong. That's what we're facing right now. The way we're training, or at least in, in some parts of it, uh, I trained like that 37 years ago as a, as a young Marine, and we haven't changed much. And the world has changed and left that behind. And if industry can do anything to make the force more lethal, in my mind, besides the weapon systems, it's being able to have us have soldiers, sailor, airmen, and Marines that can train themselves because they, they are capable of doing that. They are capable of taking in data and making decisions. And if you can do anything to help us immerse them in uh, an environment, an ISR environment, if they utilize all of the capability that they would have in combat, that would make us uh, much more lethal. Um, we also uh, have invested heavily in uh, our reachback ability, federated uh, intelligence capability. We do that because you can get reps and sets if you have Marines around the globe that are always engaged uh, in some uh, space uh, dealing with a competitor. 
and if we can continue to do that, I think we'll, uh, the readiness piece will come and uh, we'll get better because those intel marines that are uh, in those formations will have already been working the problem long before they deploy and, and as they uh, exercise those particular capabilities. Um, I think you're going to hear a lot of similar themes here. A little bit different than the Coast Guard. We're not like a garrison and deploy uh, concept. We're, we're doing daily ops, and then last year three major hurricanes come along, and we do that in addition to the daily ops. But I think what you hear is here the, the combined impact of sequestration, of uh, continuing resolutions every year, of the clearance issues, really has challenged all of our readiness in, in a lot of different ways. And then you had blended retirement recently as far as uh, what's the impact on folks as uh, Coast Guard men and women as they go forward and making key decisions when they get to the midpoint of their careers. So just to piggyback on one thing that Dimitri said, and that's you know training. We're always trying to make our training more agile, simple and more adaptive. Think about it, I'm gonna exaggerate here, but you know, you get an iPhone, you, how much training do you get on how to use iPhone? It's not much, it's, it's pretty intuitive. So what we're looking for is training modules that are more intuitive and, and quicker turnaround time on, on overhauling them. I think the generation that we have coming in is a lot more adaptive to that. So we're hoping to leverage that to get them up to speed. So just to, to give another aspect to what do we mean when we say readiness? Um, and, and what are we ready for? So we have to look at rolling up our sleeves when we're, readiness is about joint war fighting. No service is going to fight by itself. So we have to look at our joint war fighting capability. And uh, from an ISR perspective, we've joined hands with the Navy and we actually are going to have our first ISR exercise where we're going we're gonna to work together uh, at, out at Fallon here in October. And it's a step one, but it's, it's as Dimitri said, it's roll up your sleeves and get back to sets and reps. How do we actually work together? How do we share the tools that we have? What skill craft are we looking at for the future? And how do we transition our different limitations and our different capabilities so that we can sync up and effectively partner and joint fight? We also would like to, and we have, and are looking forward to integrating in the Army and the Marines so that the ISR folks can all look at how do we actually look at the trade craft, the skill craft that we have, how do we get really down to the speed of relevance so that we can get at decision advantage. And we understand we have to do that in a joint capacity. So we have to start with our own exercises where we can start developing new trade craft, new skill sets, and really, really linking up the outstanding aspects that each service brings and bringing it into a joint component. When you look at the various exercises that have been out there, uh, and for the Air Force, you know, it's the different flags, uh, it, it's the different COCOM um, exercises, it's different regional exercises. ISR has always been a part of it, but it has not been the focus of the training. It has enabled training. So we are now looking at how do we make it the focus of the training so that we can actually look at where are we where do we need to improve and how do we link our capabilities together so that it is seamless? The data can transition and transport to be secured. And then I'd leave you with, it really does get back to, and I always sound like a little bit of a broken record, but when we look at the Air Force Next Generation ISR Dominance Flight Plan, we start out with AI and data strategy. So the reason why we looked at our disruptive technologies and how do we incorporate them is as we look to the future and we look at new skill sets and tradecraft, as, as General Henry said, we don't want to be where we were 30 years ago. We want to use these technologies and we want to be able to transition across the services with what tools are working for you, what TTPs have you developed, how are you integrating and how do we share. And we don't want to just do it from a joint aspect, we want to do it from a coalition aspect. And in addition to our coalition and partners, we really want to do it with industry because we have to have you feeding us and, and giving us new techniques and new capabilities because you all do run internal exercises with what the capabilities you're developing. And we need to bring those and incorporate those. And we have to start with looking at how are the technologies going to help us? How are we going to get our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines able to look at the why from the data, 
versus what we do today in a very industrial manner with manpower describing the what the data is showing us. So that is an area as we progress with our ISR exercising to hone our skills, how do we transition to the trend analysis and the fusion aspect to get its speed of rele relevance for decision advantage to those at the tactical edge? I agree with all of that. Um, from an Army perspective, though, readiness is expensive. It's about the right people, the right equipment, the right training at the right time, and that span of time uh, is finite. From an intelligence perspective, we, we need our soldiers to be able to go from tactical to national and to be able to have that reach. So I'm, I'm concerned about individual skill sets and credentialing and certifications. Our geospatial analysts having the right NGA certificates to be able to operate in that domain. Our SIGINT soldiers being, being uh, credentialed to operate in that, in that SIGINT domain with our NSA partners. So that, that individual credentialing happens in the institution and a lot of our foundry nodes. Our foundry nodes are those platforms that train those individual skill sets uh, in garrison. They partner between uh, really INSCOM, Intelligence Security Command, as well as Forces Command. So that's the individual side of it. But then on the collective side, we develop this thing called the Military Intelligence Training Strategy, or MITS. It's a gated training strategy, much like tank gunnery or Bradley gunnery. We start at the individual crew team level, so it allows those MI companies and formations to be ready at the same time that their supported maneuver formations are ready to go, whether it's a CTC rotation or into combat. And, and on that, know that the Army is still engaged along with our Marines, Air Force, and Navy in combat operations every single day, so that doesn't stop. The focus on the VEO threat, the CT coin threat does not stop. At the same time, we have to be trained and ready for what's coming over the horizon uh, with these future threats that we've uh, been discussing today. Hey, Scott, I'd like to like to keep it with you and then come back up the, the line here. Um, recruiting and and, uh, and retention. You know, you've talked about readiness to each hit the, the training piece, but recruiting retention, particularly in those high-end skill sets. You know, we talk a lot about cyber, linguists, and so forth. Those high-end skill sets, in particular, that are and high demand in industry, do you have some, you know, can you give us some insights on how you all are doing with recruiting and retaining? And then just to add on the other piece, uh, you know, during these lean years, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, services went to industry to bring in sort of staff augmentation in those specific areas. Uh, can you just sort of weave that together on some of these high-end things that are going to be so desperately important to the fight we're talking about? Sure. I, th I think all of us sitting uh, at this on this panel, uh, all of our services offer great uh, technical training, and it's not hard to find uh, young Americans out there who want to serve their country and all the services that come in for that great technical training. So recruiting them uh, is not the biggest problem. Retaining them uh, is the biggest problem. So think of that that young man or woman who's been in the Army three, four, five years has significant technical skills and certifications, whether from an intelligence agency or working, working on electronic warfare kit, um, they can be drawn off very easily from, from industry. So if I could put that out to you, you know, keep, keep in mind that we need, we, need our, we need our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to be doing the right things for, for our country. So it's very, it's very difficult to retain. So we're using retention bonuses, we're using assignment choice preferences, and we're, we're doing what we can uh, to keep them, uh, keep them on the Army team as we go forward. So I would start out, I know you all understand this, but I think it bears repeating. We have an all-volunteer force. So we're retaining an all-volunteer force. Uh, and I would offer you, I went to Carnegie Mellon to look at their Artificial Intelligence Center. And the dean got up and said, you know, it, we find it very difficult to actually compete for our senior masters and PhD programs because the pool of individuals every year that we compete to, to attract is about 330,000. Well, guess what? That's the same number that all four of the services, all federal government, all industry, all academia are actually fighting for every single year. There's a, about an average of about 330,000 people that are between the age of about 20 to 25. So when we look at um, our, our competition and we look at China, we, we see they have a different look at things. They have more PhD students than we have students. But to get to the issue at hand, out of those 330,000, I have to agree 100%, we're not, we're not having an accessions problem. 
And I would say right now, we, the retention, I would say it, it is how do we actually ensure that our mid-level officers and enlisted and civilians are still attracted to work with the best people, with the best technology, to do something greater than themselves on working on the nation's most wicked problems. And I gotta say, that does, that does attract and retain a significant amount of our force, but it doesn't retain all of the force. So you have to think of some things and, and walk a mile in their shoes, and you have to look at what, what are they being reinforced with? What are they being told is of value by a specific service? And so um, one of the things I did is I actually hired a, a very, very young junior 03, and I put him on my staff. And I did this because this individual is a digital native, and he thinks and looks very differently than everyone else on my staff. And um, after being there for about 10 months, he came up and he said, ma'am, we've been doing language incentive programs for decades, and we have mastered it at, for all the services uh, with our Defense Language Institute. And we have milestones, and, and we reward our different human native speakers with bonuses. Why don't we do that for machine language? Why aren't we re-incentivizing coding? Why aren't we testing and evaluating who's coming in with that capability? And I gotta tell you, I wasn't the only one who was like, duh. Um, uh, we went to Manpower and Readiness, uh, Assistant Secretary who said, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Let's start surveying all of our airmen because we actually are assessing our airmen that have the capability to code in Python and Ruby and other complex codes because they game every day. And the win at gaming, they rewrite the code so they can win. So why don't we survey them? So we are starting to survey our airmen to look at how do we incentivize the different coding. That started us to think differently about retention tools. It isn't just about the incentive of the money. It's actually telling them we value this capability that you innately brought to the service and we're gonna highlight that and we're gonna reward that and we're gonna identify that. And that really resonates with our junior folks, whether they be officer, enlisted, or civilian. So that's another area we can partner with industry because you all have fantastic HR programs where you look at rewards and incentives to things that we have not had to look at. And I'd love to have dialogue on what aspects do you look at? Because I'm sure there's more out there than just simple coding, but it's, it's another avenue that we would like to look at. I agree with everything that's been said. I won't repeat that. Just highlight a couple things. A mindset change is really what we need. Our retention is pretty good in the Coast Guard. In fact, we actually recruit a lot of people from these other services. Thank you for that. Um, There's no shirt change. Exactly. We wear the Tic same shirts. Particularly the Air Force. Uh, but <laughs> I'll just highlight something we're doing at our Coast Guard Academy. So um, it's hard to change a curriculum at our academy. I'm not sure, you know, other academies how it is, but ours is particularly hard. But we actually created a cyber security curriculum there, built a SIPR classroom several years ago. So if you have the ability to teach up to the secret level. But beyond that, just how do we encourage, I'm just going to select the, the cyber uh, career path right now. For years, it's been for the Coast Guard, you've got to go to sea for your first tour of duty in the Coast Guard because, hey, we're seagoing service in 1790. How could you do anything else? Two years ago, we made a decision. We're going to start sending people right out of the academy, right out of that cyber curriculum to our cyber command. Test it, see how the, it works out. But it just, I'll just give you that. That's just one example of how we're trying to we're going to hear from all of us. How do we look at creative ways of not to recruit and train? That's the easier part. It's the retain keep people hooked for a lifetime. It's not all about the money. It's about they feeling loved, like uh, already been said, and, uh, and they have job satisfaction in, in doing the mission. And that's what we're trying to hook there. So we're giving up some people. Hey, you don't have to go to sea. How that works out. Can they do cyber for an entire career? I, think. Hey, I want to uh, reframe it a, a little bit uh, and just give you a, the background on Marine Corps. One of the, one of the parts of the question was linguist 
and cyber and, and so many other uh, more difficult to, to retain. The Marine Corps, no one comes in the Marine Corps to be a linguist. We don't recruit linguists. We don't go advertising for linguists. We don't do that in the Marine Corps. Uh, you join the Marine Corps because you want to be a Marine and, and take the challenge. What we do do is while they're down at uh, boot camp is, you know, we look at, we're looking at those tests and we have folks down there that are spotting and assessing those individuals with, with the, uh, the characteristics that we're looking for. And then those Marines uh, then go, get pulled out of the pool and they go and they get an MOS to go and be a linguist. So we're somewhat, I think we're somewhat different than the other services. So we don't do that. Uh, there's some ups and downs of that. The, the up is you get some of the, some of the more qualified folks uh, off the top because the GT score that we, that we target is 110, and uh, that's something we found that's uh, able to at least help uh, solidify the fact that they may be able to uh, learn Mandarin or learn Russian or some of the other more uh, difficult languages. So we start with that, and then uh, I think it's been echoed here, and I'll echo it again. The difficult part is the retention part. And for us, what we found is that Marines want to do their job. And, you know, part of that job, though, is being trained and educated. And I'll go back to my stick. You don't get anything else from the Marines sitting at the table. Is we have to come up with a way that allows them to train themselves in an environment that's immersive, uh, whether it's uh, about languages, whether it's about coding, uh, or any of those things that are, are considered difficult. On the cyber side, the Marine Corps has uh, created uh, an MOS. We didn't have one before. Uh, before, we were taking some of the SIGINT uh, Marines that uh, had the propensity to do that or were working in an area, and then we trained them and uh, we got them into the cyber world. The Marine Corps decided uh, earlier this year that we would start, or last year, we would start actually recruiting to that MOS. So we're still in the learning phase uh, of whether it's going to work or not. Uh, I, su I suspect that it'll be just like any other uh, of the services. If you provide them with the leadership, you provide them with the, the, the motivation and all those things, because to me, I don't, I don't see the money as being the, the issue. Certainly some folks are motivated by it, but if you're uh, attracted to the Marine Corps, you probably didn't come in to get rich. Uh, I would say that really for any of the services. So I, I think there's a little bit of, of that. Maybe someone learns a little bit more about uh, the need for a bonus or something. But uh, for us in the Marine Corps, it's about making sure that those Marines are, are utilized uh, the way that they were trained to be utilized and then actually giving them the good training in order to, to keep them motivated. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'll close out the comment here. Um, you know, the lifeblood of our services is, is the talent that we bring in. And so uh, whether we meet our recruiting goals or not, it, it, it is always something that we focus on. I, I think that's probably unanimous across the board here. Our, our experience in terms of retention in the Navy uh, is an example. If we've had a strike that, that came back that uh, worked high off tempo, came off an of extended deployment, we found in many cases the retention was higher. It, w it was exactly as you said, Henry. You know, they w they join because they want to work, and and they find value in in doing meaningful work, and and that's really our challenge. But we're always looking at those key skill sets and um, in areas where we're seeing some of the most challenges is in some areas, um, uh, you know, high concentration of metropolitan areas that will recruit away some of our high end talent. It just happens, and it's something that we pay attention to. Um, a couple of things, though, uh, tools that we have been given uh, that certainly on the Navy side will intend to, to explore and some of the recent uh, NDAAs that have, that have come out have offered some different approaches in terms of bringing talent on board. Uh, from our civilians, there's the cyber accepted service route that allows greater flexibility, uh, potentially an easier, shorter path of, of hiring. Uh, reduction less of or actually no time and grade requirements to accelerate. Uh, we'll look to expl explore that in terms of how we looked at those are for key skill sets. Uh, also in the most recent NDAA um, for military officers was options of uh, a lateral in process for those key skill sets that could be brought in based on the level of their skills and experience. Uh, maybe not bringing them in as an O1 and bring them at higher levels. Um, I'll say in both those areas for, the, for that program as well as the cyber acceptance service, we are in the very early stages of exploring it. 
uh, but it, it is a tool that we think could be effective. So we intend to uh, take, a, take a, a hard look at it. I notice we're uh, we're at the uh, expiration time here, and you all have uh, probably four more hours of work today. So uh, I'd like to uh, to first do an administrative uh, announcement, and that is remember the happy hour that the uh, youngsters, the under 40s, are doing down in the sports bar, and then uh, and close out by by thanking uh, uh, thanking all of you uh, for putting us on your schedule, keeping us on your schedule, and for all of you being here and, and participating today.